So I'm going to go ahead and piggyback on what Ryan mentioned. He said a couple key things. One was kind of head west or go west. Uh, when you get into my deck, you'll chuckle because it looks like we built them together. Uh, as far as the title, putting smart glasses to work for professionals in large enterprise, it's a pretty good sized title. I tend to like to take bigger things and break them down. So I think just to keep it really simple, what we're going to talk about is how do you take imagery uh, that could be pushed to you or pulled from you and really help you just do work better. And the idea when we say do work better means to reduce cost, reduce risk, or make more money. So with that, here's the go west. Um, the idea for kind of a kicking it off is how many people here were attending this very show last year? Raise of hands. So a little around the halfway mark, maybe slightly less. How many people are new this year? A lot more, a lot more. So this was an image that I showed in a talk track last year. And we kind of capstoned last year for either head-worn displays, or you can call it HMDs, or smart glasses as, I believe in AR. And the idea was, it was a lot of individuals kind of carrying the flag into a company or corporation saying, this excites me. I hope it excites you too. I want to buy one and try it and see if it works. And I think that's a pretty good capstone to how 16 felt, at least as a vendor serving enterprise and in the AR space. Um, so I, I would capstone 16 as it was an I believe in AR year, really individuals waving the flag. If you look at 2017, it feels a little bit more like this. So if we go back to the image, few people outside of a company, right, heading west. This is a picture where there's more people, if you count them, and they're inside a company. So I would capstone this year as something in the area of we believe in AR. You could maybe push it as far as saying we understand AR, we're deploying AR, but I would say that you're pushing the envelope if you're really saying we are deployed and we're using AR as an enterprise. That's counted in a handful of companies in the globe today where they're really deployed, not labs, not field trials, but really deployed. So I think that's where we are, is we've gone from I believe to we believe and understand to now how do we do it? And that's what we'll talk about. So it's been an eventful 12 months if you compare last year to now. We've got a lot more awareness, meaning individuals to teams or departments. We've got real use cases. And it's not measured by one, but there are many. There's dozens of use cases. You heard a handful just in the last presentation. You'll learn dozens across the day. Uh, I'm happy to talk to those in a Q&A session after this or, or down the road. And the economic outcomes are clear. I think Ryan did a good job in the previous presentation of focus on the worthy problem. <clears throat> if you don't have a worthy problem, your measurement in AR is going to be kind of a snooze fest, and that's going to be hard to align an enterprise to invest money and change their culture on how they work. So I think clear impact on measurement requires both the team wanting to do the deployment, the team deploying it, and if you want to bring more change to your org, you've got to prove that it was worthwhile. And I think the biggest piece is the users of the devices are informed. They're coming into meetings saying, I want binocular or I prefer monocular for this reason. That was not the case last year. Most people were saying, what's that? And they didn't know what a binocular versus monocular pair of glasses were. They didn't know what field of view meant. They didn't understand convergence. Now those words are much more common when you start talking to users. If those are words are not common to you sitting in the audience, just ask one of us, we'll tell you. But you should also just go try them all on and see which ones work for you as an individual, but also for your use case, because there is no one size fits all. And then improving hardware form factors. I think it's a huge compliment to the Intels, the ODGs, Vue6, Epson, the list goes on and on, Daiquiri, et cetera. They've all done a great job with battery and field of view. They're all pushing this technology for us to make it more usable. And not usable for 10 minutes, but usable for hours. Someday usable for a full work session, meaning 8 or 12 hours. But that's still a lot to ask of these glasses. So that's kind of what occurred across 12 months, a lot of maturity, right? both by technology, by awareness, et cetera. If we go into kind of where the traction is most, again, this is a 15-minute session, so we're kind of skipping just right across the surface. But this is meant to say, from our view, meaning a fear, a company that builds software for enterprise companies in AR, we see if you're a manufacturing company, you have a use case. If you're building something really expensive or really heavy, that also is a really kind of good multiplier or to Ryan's comment, something that compounds it. We'll talk about why. If you're building that thing from an assembly standpoint or you're servicing that thing you've built, that thing could be an airplane, it could be an automobile, it could be a large piece of machinery. Again, pretty good use case. But then there's some wrinkles that come out. 
you probably have a noisy environment, so voice control may not always work. It can work beautifully, but it needs to be a certain level of, of ambient noise. You might have a tool in your hand, or you might have a glove on your hand. Therefore, sometimes touch pads won't be the most intuitive or the most useful, and it's going to slow you down. These things are supposed to speed you up, so we have to meet the user where they are, not have them swim to our device. So there's lots of subtleties on when you say assembly and service, what that might mean from a design requirement of hardware software. But then also, I think in previous sessions, they were mentioning the importance of getting to the business. Uh, I think the last speaker said that's where it goes to die if you head to the IT or innovation group to start. I don't know that that's necessarily true. You have to play with all groups in enterprise because they all play a role. Uh, some people are there to guard and protect to make sure that bad doesn't happen. Some people are there to innovate and break doors down to kind of cause change. But all parties have to exist in enterprise, so you do need to serve them. I would suggest that you focus on getting someone to adopt and sponsor the project, maybe on the business side. We found operations, when you're thinking about manufacturing or heavy machinery, assembly or service, ops is a great group. If you don't think about ops, manufacturing is a great group. There's all those sub-segments called field services. All those groups will listen to you because they have these pain points. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you also have to think big. You're not going to go sell a AR solution or adopt it wildly in a company called Doug's Donuts, unless Doug Donuts is huge. But going to someone who's building machines to build donuts, that might work. But you've got to be up in the food chain so there's enough volume that when you're saving that suggested 5 or 10% improvement, you can really make an impact in their EPS or earnings per share. So that's where the traction is. I would summarize it because I'm much more visual as this. If you're building something where you go, oh my gosh, we can't fix this without so-and-so, and that so-and-so is not standing next to you, but you have to probably fly them in, that could be flown in from across the hallway, but again, they can just walk to you. But literally, you're saying they need to get on a jet to help you solve something, meaning fix it or make it begin again. Like, let's say you're a manufacturer with a synchronous line. Uh, I was on a panel a couple weeks ago with a group from BMW, and they produce one car a minute and their average car is more than $50,000. So they're looking at a $3 million loss if they don't get that line back up, because anywhere along the line that pauses, nothing spits out the tail. So when they have a problem with a vendor building a piece of machinery, they're losing $3 million an hour. They're going to fly someone out on a very fast plane to fix it. But wouldn't they love to do this, which is kind of like, beam me up. I just want to see it and see if I can solve it before I get on a plane. Plane costs money. Plane costs way too much time. And we're hemorrhaging that $3 million per hour. So I think what AR, AR, and MR kind of combine, whether it's got a 3D method of kind of tracking the real world or not, that's really what it's promising as far as what enterprise can do with this technology today, is we can basically make the need to fly people around to fix stuff that breaks. And you can kind of teleport them virtually to see the problem, rally a lot of smart people around, and see if you can solve it, or at least bring the right tools and the right team to solve it. Because a lot of these field services groups say, we actually fly people twice. One person goes out and goes, oh, I can't fix that, but Ted can, or Larry, and he needs a very different tool. And they've done two flights, and now it's three or four days, and the millions have stacked up. So if nothing else, put a pair of glasses on, call home and have some really smart people collaborate going, now we know what it is, we really feel it, we'll send the right team. Or possibly you can solve it right there. So with that, here's what we've observed. See what I see seems to be kind of the killer application. Um, if you're not doing see what I see today, kind of back to the compound of innovation from the previous speaker, Ryan, you are going to start to get surpassed in the coming year. Uh, if you start now, you're not late. So go back home and say, hey, it's OK, we haven't missed the wagon. But if you're not doing it in the next 12 months and really doing it outside of a lab and in a field, I think there's people that will work faster than you. And that's a shame. You should pick something up and try it. Um, users in high traction industries, again, manufacturing, et cetera, uh, have tools and gloves like we mentioned. So the interactions of buttons or voice or gestures or head motion, those are all modalities of how to communicate between a human body and a device. A lot of the hardware out there today has one or two of those. We at Ethere think one of the best approaches is to have many of those. Because at some point, I have noise, I can't use my voice. I have a glove or a tool, I'm probably not going to touch a trackpad. Or I'm doing a video call and I've got an expert looking, my head motion is going to drive them crazy. So you need to have a lot of different options to say, how do I going to talk to this device so that home can see something great and help me on the field solve it fast? 
But the bottom one is where it's really hard. And I think, again, coming up with artful UI, so the interaction is more intuitive than not. The device can be pulled by the users versus pushed and then kind of become shelfware. That's where I think all of us in this room have a little bit of a role to play. We need to deploy these things to users early and get feedback and tell software companies like us, that's not going to work and here's why. Or to hardware makers to say, I need you to change this and add more modalities because it's, it's going to starve on the factory floor. All of us need to kind of, to the previous speaker, head west and move this along. But there's a lot of change that still has to occur to make it flawless. We're not quite there. So what we've learned your users and their work environments are really diverse. There's no one size fits all. I wish there was, but it doesn't exist. I think that these users have high standards. They should, right? They're experts in their area of focus. They know exactly what to do. And when they don't, they want help. And that help needs to work. If that system falters or flickers or any kind of thing starts to not work right, even just the Wi-Fi signal is lossy, Skepticism falls in and they go, this is too early for me. Thanks, I'll take a tablet. Or better yet, thanks, I'll just put the email in, request, go have a beer and wait for you to fly your person out on the plane. So to make it right, we've got to really dial these solutions in. So kind of back to a recap, we started off with 2016 was an I believe scenario. Individuals carrying the torch of AR. This year is companies are now starting to say, hey, those people that were talking AR last year were onto something. I'm seeing this be an applicable use case. Let's try it in our lab. Let's now take it from the lab to the field. And when I say field, it's a controlled environment with real users. And if you can pass that, both from a software hardware perspective, and you've really got the right problem, you can now truly deploy it, right? And you can start to scale it from geo to geo. If you look at 2018, just kind of a futuristic play on the automobile, it's now time to take it to a much more advanced state. But to do that, here's kind of the cliff notes. I'm seeing lots of people take pictures. This is the one that you should take a picture of. If you do this, you'll be fine. So the idea is, and I think if you don't hear this from a vendor, they're, they're giving you some snake oil. I would not buy it until you have the problem figured out. So do not do anything in AR until you know what you want to solve. The second thing is equally important, which is, now that I know what I want to solve, because I'm saying it's a worthy problem, let's define what worthy means. Worthy is not that your job is easier and you can hang out with your friends more. It's that your job might be more efficient or cost less so that your executive team and your investors all make more money. Ultimately, you have to save cost, reduce risk, or make more money, or all of those. And if you do that, you've aligned the company, right? Every single engineer, every single field service person, artist, you name it, executive, they'll all say, let's do this. Until you find that problem with that much kind of impact of the company, you're on the fringe, and at some point, someone's going to step in saying, this doesn't work for us. It's either too expensive, it's too slow, or there's another priority. So I would start with the first bullet. After that, you've got to do some homework, which is, What's the current state? How do we do it today? How do we approach the problem? And what does it cost us? Because you then have to benchmark or compare this new shiny thing called AR and show why it's better. So with that, come up with the plan of who's going to help you do the testing in a lab, who's going to help you do the testing in the field. I'd have those be advocates for early, meaning people that care about change and want to kind of try new things. And you want to listen to them. And then from there, recognize not one size fits all. So once you have the problem and the cost understood, now go talk to vendors saying, here's the thing I'm trying to do. Are, are, are you that? And have them vie for that position. And at some point, you can reduce a lot of people you have to talk to. And just talk to three or four that are really targeted to that problem statement. Then they should help immensely. It'll help you try it faster. They'll help you. And you should know how to measure the results because you can benchmark it. And once you do that, it's agile all over again. You try it again and again and again until you get it right. And when you get it right, you're a hero. Your plaque goes on a wall, and they deploy thousands of devices, and your company makes lots of earnings per share. That's not happening today all over, but it's happening in pockets. And those groups that are doing it now are kind of giggling, saying, this is fun, and we're making change. We're making money. Let's do it again. And so it's not impossible. It's just a matter of inertia. Um, so with all that, that's kind of where we are as an industry and where we are as a company, and I'm hoping where we are as a room. Um, but at the bottom line, we have a philosophy to fear, which is the smartest person in the room is all of us. And I think that's what AR provides. It gives you a chance to kind of bring a teleport kind of in and bring intellect from afar to help you solve really gnarly problems. And if you do it right, it can be beautiful. You can shave immense amounts of thrash out and, and make people smile and feel good about your job. 
So that's kind of what we think of when we thought about AR for the enterprise. Uh, we blew through slides pretty quick. We have time for questions. If you have questions, lay them on us. If you don't, you can walk the floor and see us at booth 333 and ask us harder questions. All right, so I'll take one question knowing that um, we've uh, run out of time, and thank you, Christian. Um, so production use cases, so see a lot of one-offs, uh, one-off custom projects. Have you seen any uh, successful production projects? So we have seen a handful. I won't measure these in multiple hands, meaning they're under five that are in deployment. Um, going from lab to field, we have a number of clients that have moved from a controlled environment with no real users, they're test users with sample data. We have now many companies that are in field trials using glasses with real production data. But they're not deployed, and when I say not deployed, it means that you're still holding a user's hand, giving them a great deal of education of, here's what this is, this is how you use it, this is why we're using it, please touch it, tell us what you think. Um, as far as companies that are now in production, we have a handful that are less than five uh, that are in production this year. And we can't talk about those because we're under NDA with those logos. But there are automotive makers that are on manufacturing lines saying, oh my god, we've got to get this widget out because that widget's expensive. Or I have a machine on a manufacturing line that must stay up. And if it doesn't, we hemorrhage large dollars. So anywhere there's a big piece of heavy machinery where the machine can't be sent back in an envelope, there's an AR use case waiting to be hatched. All right, great. Christian, thanks again. Thanks.